Alleluia. Alleluia, Lord and Savior. Open now your saving word. Let it burn like fire within us. Speak until our hearts are stirred. Alleluia, Lord, we sing for the good news that you bring. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. From that time on, after Peter confessed that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the Gospel of the Lord. I invite you all to be seated. John, I'm not going to ask you to come up again, but you are right. No, no. So no kids in our in-person worship today, but today we are going to talk about anointing with oil. I'd like to tell them that the word Messiah that Simon Peter declared Jesus to be means anointed one. And so we're going to talk about some earthly things that are divine. So first I'm going to ask the kids, what is bread made from? And some will say baking soda and salt. And, but the main ingredient is wheat. I'm going to say wheat, okay? Where does wheat come from? It comes from the ground. It comes from the earth. Okay, what is wine made of? Made ingredient, grapes. Yes, another thing that comes from the ground, that comes from the earth. I'm going to ask kids, what is oil made from? And there's all sorts of different types of oil. But vegetable, olive, avocado, whatever, comes from the earth. Things that come from, from the earth. And then we have water. For baptism, God gives us these earthly elements and makes them divine, like water and baptism, like bread and wine for communion, and like oil for anointing. So we were going to uh, practice and, and experience what it is to be anointed. Scripture says, if any are sick, let them come and have, them, or have the elders lay their hands on them, and then anoint them, and then pray for them. So I was going to do that with the kids, and mark the sign of the cross on their foreheads, like had been done at their baptism, and like will be done when they are dying. To remind them that the anointed one, the Messiah, loves them, and is with them. And like water and wine and grapes and, and wheat and oil, they too have been made holy. So, any kids watching, I hope that you can run to your kitchen, grab some oil, and be reminded that you are anointed by God. Not by us, but by God. Let us say a prayer. Repeat after me, congregation. <laughs> Good morning, God. We love you. Thank you for blessing us. And 
making us holy. Amen. Here we are. Uh, there's a school system, a large school system, that has a program to help children that are in the hospital keep up with their schoolwork. And one day, a teacher was assigned to that program, and they received a routine phone call uh, asking to help with a, a particular child. So she got the name of the child and the room number and some of the lessons that they would be learning and went to the hospital. She wasn't prepared for what she'd find, though. The little boy had been burned very badly and was in severe pain. And when she saw him, she was stunned and shocked and stammered through her words, but began by saying, I've been sent by the school to help you with your nouns and adverbs. Eventually, when she left, she felt that she hadn't really accomplished much, but the next day, when she got there, the nurse said to her, what did you do to that boy? The teacher felt like she must have done something wrong and began to apologize. And the nurse corrected her, saying, no, no, you don't know what I mean. We've been worried about that little boy, but ever since yesterday, his whole attitude has changed. He's fighting back. He's responding to treatment. It's as though he's decided to live. A week later, weeks later, when the boy was feeling better, he explained that he had completely given up hope until that teacher arrived. Everything changed when she said, I'm here to help you, so you're not going to be behind when you come back. And he said, they wouldn't send a teacher to work on nouns and adverbs to a dying boy, would they? Never take hope for granted. We see the word hope throughout scripture. There's a few Hebrew words that are uh, translated for hope. Uh, as the waters receded at, um, during the flood with Noah, Noah had to yakal for weeks. Hope for weeks. Wait for weeks. In other parts of scripture, we hear how the farmers had to kava for good grapes. They hoped for. They waited with expectation for good grapes. And we hear these words, these Hebrew words for hope, all throughout the Psalms. We hope for the Lord. We wait for the Lord because he is loyal and will redeem us. Hope is not to be confused with optimism. Optimism is about choosing to see in any situation how things can work out for the best. I'm optimistic that my kids will clean their bedrooms. That's my desired outcome. But biblical hope is not based on circumstance. It's based on a person. Biblical hope is, is not focused on the situation itself or an expectation that we might have that things will go the way we want. In fact, hopeful people in the Bible often recognize there's no evidence that things will get better, but they choose hope anyways. The prophet Hosea lived in a very dark time when Israel had been uh, oppressed by foreign empires. And Hosea chose hope. And he cho chose hope because he knows our God is a loyal and redeeming God. He'd seen how the, our God rescued the people through, um, from the Exodus, and during the Exodus, and that God could do it again. It was God's past faithfulness and loyalty that motivates his hope for the future. We can look forward with hope only by looking back. Psalm 39 says, O Lord, what else can I hope? 
for you are my hope. Our hope is not based on circumstance, based on a person. In our gospel story today, Peter is devastated in hearing about what the Messiah must do. Remember last week we talked about Peter, named Peter because it's, he's the rock, right? His message is steadfast. We often call Peter the rock. But this week, that rock has become a stumbling block. He's devastated once he hears Jesus say that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests, and then that Jesus must be killed, and then on the third day be raised. This is not what Peter hoped for. God forbid it, Lord, he says, not like this. God forbid it, Lord, not like this is something I've uttered a fair bit this year. (laughs) This year of 2020 has been a challenging one for countless reasons, not just for individuals, but certainly for our world as a whole. God forbid it, Lord, not like this. This is not how I envisioned 2020 to go. But as Christians, we know that our hope comes not from wishful thinking or the desire to see things work out just right or the way we think is right. We look for things that are, like Peter, we look at things. We, like Peter, look at things and want some better pathway through, some easier, less costly way through. Certainly not through great suffering and tribulation and death like Jesus said he would experience. But our hope is not based on circumstance. It's based on a person. Throughout the Old Testament, God's people struggled. They had hope. Job struggled, but he had hope. Habakkuk struggled, but he had hope. Through exile or famine or brokenness, they hope. Our hope is not built off of circumstances. Our hope is built on Christ. As I've mentioned, a portion of our service today will be dedicated for prayers of healing and wholeness. Now, traditionally, when we have this service in this congregation, we take a few minutes, we say some prayers, we sing songs, and you are invited to come forward for anointing and laying on of hands in prayer. We're going to do that at the end of worship for any who would like to remain. You can come forward and kneel, and we will practice that carefully. But we are not able to do that in the same way this year. But we anoint people in times of sickness, times of healing. As I mentioned to the I would have to the kids. We anoint at times of baptism and the commendation of the dying. Whatever suffering we have, whatever experience that we're going through, our Messiah, our anointed one, is with us. Whatever hurt or worry or battles we are fighting, the Messiah, the anointed one, is with us. And this gives us hope. Not that the circumstances will turn out exactly how we want, but we trust that they are going to be as Christ plans for us. Christian hope comes not from wishful thinking that things will turn out just the way we want, or that the best outcome will be the only outcome. Christian hope relies on Christ, on a person. Peter didn't like the outcome that Jesus described today. Neither did his disciples as they followed him to Golgotha. Biblical hope isn't optimism based on odds. It's a choice to wait for God to bring about a future that is as surprising as a crucified person rising from the dead. Christian hope looks back to the risen Christ in order to look forward with hope. 
At the start of worship, we have a confession and forgiveness. And after we make our confession to God, we are given these words of forgiveness that are rooted in hope. We hear, our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint. Through the exile, through pandemics, through droughts, through hurricanes, we wait for the Lord. We wait in the Lord. We hope. There's a song by Ginny Owens, um, and Ginny Owens is a blind piano player who performed at the last youth gathering. John was there. He heard her. I fell in love with her, her beautiful songs. And she wrote a song called, I Will Praise You. And here are a couple words. When there's no cloud in the sky, and when the world is on my side, and I feel your hand in mine, I will praise you. When my day becomes a night, when I cannot see your light, I will walk by faith, not sight. I will praise you. I will praise you in the deep, for it's there that my eyes see the truth. When I dance for joy or when I weep, I will praise you. Our hope, our joy, our praise are not founded on some specific set of circumstances, but on Christ. The little boy in the hospital bed was given hope. It wasn't a hope that he wouldn't have scars or that everything or anything would be easy. It was hope for a future. And our hope comes from the Lord, who took the hard road, the hard path, and showed us that the worst things are never the last things. And for this we praise God. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, in you we hope. In you we wait. Give us the eyes to see what you have called us to. Give us that promise of the resurrection. May it bring us joy in your presence. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen.